That'll do it for me, Kingswood. Yow! Hello everyone, my name is Elliot Geisler, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Get Real. Now, let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever watched any of those other sports shows on ESPN, maybe it's on Fox, and you just think to yourself that the things they're saying and the way they're saying it just seem so fake? Well, that's because a lot of those guys have some executive hothead above them telling them what to think and how to react, and they'll over-exaggerate some of their opinions, and honestly, they just make up some of the other ones. None of that's going to happen here. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think with zero strings attached. So, without further, without further ado, let's do what every good sports show does and begin with the NFL. It's been an exciting three weeks to start off the season. A lot of things have happened that a lot of people didn't expect. Some teams that we thought would be really good really are not. And a lot of teams that we thought would be really bad have actually started off pretty well. So, let's start out with the Denver Broncos. A big trade for Russell Wilson made everybody think that they could compete with the Chiefs and the Chargers of the world for that title in the AFC West, but their offense has been uh, iffy to say the least. They've scored 43 points in their first three games. For context, last year with Drew Locke, they scored 76 in their first three games. With Russell Wilson being a runaround quarterback, a lot of people have started to think, is he slowing down because of that? And it's entirely possible. I'd hate to be the one to say it like officially, but he might be on the verge of washed. Another team that struggled on offense is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The biggest problem that I can see for the Buccaneers is the offensive line. They've had a lot of struggles with keeping Tom Brady protective, especially on the inside of the offensive line. You can see a lot of these sacks, they're getting right up to him and Brady's literally just collapsing because he doesn't want to get hit and he doesn't want to get hurt. Although another problem that I honestly do have to say, and I hate to say it, is that I think Part of that is Brady used to be able to overcome stuff like that. His shiftiness in the pocket used to be really good. And I'm not going to say he's downright bad at it now, but you can definitely see that he's taken a step back in that department. With the injury, or excuse me, no, it was a suspension to Mike Evans, Chris Godwin coming off of injury, obviously Rob Gronkowski retired and Antonio Brown isn't there anymore. It starts to become a big question. Is this going to be a 2015 Broncos team where it's a great quarterback at the end of his prime and the defense is what carries them to the win? Well, we'll have to see. Moving to the AFC East, the Dolphins and the Bills had a very exciting game on Sunday uh, in which the Dolphins won by the skin of their teeth after accidentally punting off of their own man and taking a safety. The Bills had a chance to get in the field goal range and win the game, but they couldn't cl clock the ball in time. Now, I think the big question that we all have to ask ourselves is, is this what the AFC East is going to look like for this foreseeable future? With Miami's new highly powered offense and their strong defense, and the Bills obviously having Josh Allen, and basically everything else is honestly pretty perfect, are these two going to be the ones duking it out for the uh, division title over the next five, ten years? It's, it's difficult to say because I don't know what to think about Tua really, but it's entirely possible. Moving down in the AFC East, obviously I do have to talk about the Patriots although I don't want to, because the problem with the Patriots right now is their defense isn't bad. I'm not going to lie. They've, they make solid plays on defense, but it seems like they're giving up a lot more easily than they used to. Um, the game on Sunday against the Ravens, that last touchdown that Lamar Jackson scored when he just ran into the end zone, Lamar Jackson's a great runner, but that run was really more just him pushing through guys, which is not what he's supposed to be able to do. Um, the other problem is Mac Jones has been on and off, um, to put it nicely. He is now injured, unfortunately, which makes it even harder for us to develop him. Um, but even without that, he's just, he seems so timid. He doesn't seem like he's, he's he, he doesn't seem like he's ready to take risks. But then when he finally does work up the courage to take a risk, he takes the wrong risk. Moving to the NFC and all the way out west to San Francisco, Trey Lance got injured which means that Garoppolo is now starting for the 49ers. Now, a lot of people have said, oh, they look better with Garoppolo. And that may be true. Right now, they may be better than they were with Trey Lance. However, I think this is really bad for the 49ers because the reason you traded all those picks to move up so far to get Trey Lance is because with Garoppolo, you could win, but there was always a limitation come the end of the season. I mean, we saw that NFC Championship last year. You can make a very good case that they lost the Super Bowl against Kansas City because of Garoppolo, and they lost that championship game against the Rams because of Garoppolo. Trey Lance was supposed to be the thing that takes you over that hump, that gets you over the top, 
and now he's hurt for the entire year, and you have Garoppolo again. You don't want to get stuck on a treadmill, but it looks like the 49ers are headed right towards it. Couple last things. Uh, the Raiders, Colts, Bears, and Washington have all also been very disappointing, especially the Raiders and the Colts because they made some big trades and you think, man, they might be able to do something this year. Neither of them have done anything. The Bears, Justin Fields has looked awful, and I like Justin Fields, but it's just not great. And Washington, I never really had faith in, any, in them anyway, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, the only reason I didn't say more about them is because, honestly, I just don't have as much to say. So... Let's move on to the National Basketball Association, and let's talk some Celtics. After catching fire throughout the playoffs last year, they flamed out a little bit in the finals when Jason Tatum struggled mightily against the Warriors' defense. Now the question comes, can they repeat that success this season? Well, let's break down how the offseason has been, because it's kind of been up and down. What they did do is they brought in Danilo Gallinari and Malcolm Brogdon, two very good pickups. I like Malcolm Brogdon off the bench, and Gallinari is good size and he's good shooting. Or he would be if he didn't tear his ACL in this offseason, and now he's going to miss the entirety of the season. We still have Brogdon. I'm feeling good. And we brought back most of the core that made us good last year. But you don't stay contenders by getting complacent. And it makes me a little bit worried. But I'm just hoping that if Brogdon can get his efficiency up, he'll be a great sixth man for the Celtics. Now, the big piece of news for the Celtics this offseason was the full season suspension of head coach Ime Udoka. I'm not going to get into why it happened. It's pretty easy to find out. Just give it a quick Google, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is how can the Celtics rebound from a loss like that? Because he was big for them last year. I liked Brad Stevens as a head coach, but you could tell they really listened to Odoka and they really liked him. Now with him gone, are the Celtics going to be able to recreate what they had, or is it going to be a completely new identity? Because remember, they started the season off horribly last year. They were the 11 seed at one point. They ended up being the two seed, but I think it was because of that coaching tr turnover that created some, I guess, incontinuity, and it caused them to not be as good at the beginning of the season. Is that going to happen again? Because that would be very concerning to me, because the turnaround that they had was very improbable. I think only Ime Udoka could have done that. So is the interim head coach going to be able to pull that off? I'm not sure. Another thing the Celtics definitely need is more playmaking from their current players. Like I said, they brought in Brogdon, that's good. And I always liked Marcus Smart as a passer. But I think guys like Jalen Brown, guys like Jason Tatum, guys like Robert Williams, they don't need to average 10 assists. Because honestly, when you, when you have a guy on your team who averages 10 assists, history shows you don't really win championships. The last time that was done was LeBron in 2020 with the Lakers. And before that, it hadn't happened since like the 70s. I think we, if Jason Tatum can get to around five assists a game, Jalen Brown could get to four, five, six a game. Marcus Smart can stay where he is. And Robert Williams just needs to get to, like, three. I think the offense is going to look a lot more fluid, and you're going to see a lot less of that kind of choppy iso ball that really killed them in the playoffs last year. Now, I think the biggest key to recapturing the success, like I said before, is coaching. If Joe Mazzulla can replicate Ud Udoka's style, I think that they have a real shot of being good again this year if they can do everything else that I've been talking about. But the question is, can they do that? And my answer is, I'm not entirely sure. And that brings me to my last point. How much longer can we really expect the window for this Celtics team to stay open? Because we always, in, in sports in general, we always think a team's championship window is far larger than it is. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, two years ago, won a Super Bowl, and they were a wild card team. And the next year, everybody was like, oh, man. Oh, they're going to be tough to beat this year. I mean, look at that defense. They got Tom Brady. They got Antonio Brown. They got Mike Evans. And then they flamed out last year against the Rams. And oh, by the way, the Rams last year won the Super Bowl. And at the beginning of this season, quite frankly, they've looked pretty horrendous. In sports, windows close faster than you think they will. And I think this Celtics team really needs to come to terms with that and really attack this season as if it's their last. Even though you're missing Udoka, and even though Brog, uh, excuse me, not Brogdon, even though Gallinari got hurt, we really have to attack this season because if we don't, we might not have another chance after this. I don't see the Warriors going anywhere. I don't see Milwaukee going anywhere. I think Miami got better. It's, it's scary in the Eastern Conference, and the Celtics really need to attack this season as if it's their last. Well, that's going to do it for the NBA talk. We'll be back right after this word.
dude, what are you still doing here? How come Tuesdays was yesterday? I'd like to thank our friends in the multimedia department for producing that wonderful PSA and for manning our crew today. Welcome to the two minute headline segment. This is not thinly veiled at all, or excuse me, it is very thinly veiled. Um, this is a two minute segment where I'm going to go over a bunch of headlines from around the world of sports that I didn't think deserve their own topic. So let me get my timer out here and let's begin. We're gonna start off with the injury to Dak Prescott and he might be back as early as next week. This is honestly making me a little bit angry. The problem is when he first got injured, we were saying, oh yeah, this is like a month and a half, two month injury. And then Jerry Jones gets on Dallas radio and says, oh no, he'll be back in like four or five weeks. And now it's been three weeks and he already might be back. I understand he might be ready to play, but I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, he's going to be a shell of himself, and there's a very high chance that he gets injured again, and I don't want that for him. I'm not a Cowboys fan, but I like people in general. I don't want to see people get hurt, and I think he's going to get hurt if he comes back too early. Moving on. Zion Williamson lost a bunch of weight this offseason. After missing the entirety of last season with some weird foot problem and then holding out and then not holding out anymore and wanting to sign an extension, He's come into this season, and on media day, I mean, he looked like a completely different person. He looked like he did back at Duke, except he just had a more mature face now. And it's terrifying, because in the one healthy season he's had, he averaged 27, 7, and a block. And now he's thinner, and probably better, so that's the thing that comes with getting thinner as an NBA player. What if his shooting gets better? What if his rebounding gets better? What if his shot blocking gets better? What if his playmaking gets better? We might be looking at a potential, like... 30 and 10 on like 70% shooting next year. Now, is that ridiculous for me to say? Yeah, a little bit, but it's actually within the realm of possibility, and that's my point. Moving on, Lonzo Ball injury. The point guard for the Chicago Bulls, Lonzo Ball, reportedly may miss the entirety of this season after missing almost all of last season with, an, with a uh, leg injury. Now, this is incredibly concerning if you're the Bulls because there was a very big line of demarcation before his injury and after his injury last year. And if they can't figure this all out, it's going to be a rough season for them, even though they have DeMar DeRozan and Zach Levine and all that. And Giannis compliments Steph. Yeah, this was just a cute thing that I saw and I thought it was funny. Um, Giannis called Steph the best player in the world. And that is our time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me on this first edition of Two Minute Headlines. And we'll be right back after this. I just remembered it's election day. Are you going to vote? I don't know. I don't think I'll have time today. Millions of eligible voters in America never make it to the polls or even register to vote. When you don't vote, you're letting other people make decisions for you and pick the things your taxes will pay for. Voting is more than a civic duty. It gives you a voice about the priorities and the future of your community and our nation. Voting gives you a seat at the table. And we're going to move on to our very own hometown Kingswood Knights. We're going to start off with our Athletes of the Week. Our female Athlete of the Week is Marcella Donito on the soccer team. And our male Athlete of the Week is Braden Raposa, who is also on the boys' soccer team. Uh, great job, you two. I also have heard that the uh, boys' soccer team, last I checked, was ranked second in the state. So keep it up, boys. Great to hear. Uh, games coming up this week. Girls' soccer on Friday has a game against Kennett. Field hockey has a game at Sauhegan on Friday. And football has a game against Fall Mountain at home. A reminder that next week is the homecoming game. Even though this weekend is the homecoming dance, everything's crazy, but it's fine. It's all going to work out in the end. Be there or be square. And we're going to move on to our final topic, back to the NFL. And I'm going to give you my final division predictions for how I see everything working out right now. So let's start out with the AFC. In the AFC East, I believe the Bills will take it, unsurprisingly. In the AFC North, I think the Ravens will do it. I think in the AFC West, we're going to have the Chiefs, unsurprisingly. And my biggest surprise of all, actually, if we can go back to the widescreen, I think the Jaguars are going to win the AFC South. Now, if you want to call me crazy for saying that, I'm not going to get mad at you. I would probably call me crazy, too. It's really just an indictment of the rest of the division. They have all looked so horrible that honestly I can't really see anybody winning this division but Jag the Jacksonville Jaguars are in the lead right now and I just really like Trevor Lawrence and I think their playmaking has gotten a lot better so you know anything's possible right but 
moving back up the list a little bit, the Bills taking the East, I don't think that's a super big surprise to anyone. Josh Allen has a case for the best quarterback in the league. Their defense has been absolutely hounding people. Stephon Diggs is still really good. They can run the ball. They can throw the ball. They can protect Josh Allen. I mean, it is just terrifying playing these guys. I would know I'm a Patriots fan. Moving to the AFC North, like I said, I think the Ravens are going to win. And this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but if you're the Ravens front office, you need to pay Lamar Jackson yesterday. I know, I know, I know, oh, at the end of games, it's a little bit harder for him to win. Yeah, at the end of games, it's harder for every quarterback to win. That's what makes the great ones great. And by the way, Lamar Jackson is great. He can run the ball better than anybody else who's ever played the position, and you are blind if you don't think he's gotten better at throwing the football. Those throws he's been making, the ones he made against the Dolphins, the ones he's been making against the Patriots, he looks fantastic. Yeah, he's not perfect. No quarterback is. You have to pay him. But even besides Lamar Jackson, obviously we know the Ravens are always going to be able to run the ball well, and something about those guys, they just always play good defense. It doesn't matter who the personnel are. It doesn't matter who the coordinator is. It doesn't matter even who the head coach is. Their defense is just great, and that's just a thing for them. And moving to the AFC West, another one that's not too surprising. I'm sorry for not having any hot takes, but really, it's just foolish to not pick these guys. It's going to be the Chiefs in the AFC West. Patrick Mahomes, I said Josh Allen has a case for the best quarterback in the league. Patrick Mahomes just is the best quarterback in the league. Like, he does things that I don't think we have ever seen anyone doing, unless, like, Otto Graham was just really great in the 50s and I missed it. And honestly, I think it's going to be a long time before we see another guy who can do stuff like that as consistently as he does. I mean, even the videos from practice look like they're from another planet. Throwing it behind his back, hitting the goalpost, throwing it left-handed and hitting a guy perfectly 60 yards down the field. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's not fair. And if you want to talk about running the ball, sure. Do they have any? Do, they, do the Chiefs have one great running back? No. But I think we all know they can run the ball if they need to. And Mahomes can run it too. He's not as fast as Lamar. He's not as shifty as Kyler. He's not as elusive as Kyler Murray or Russell Wilson. But he is slippery. I remember a couple of years ago there was a game that uh, in the playoffs against the Titans. I it was the AFC Championship. And, like, every player on the Titans' defense just missed him, and it literally didn't look like he was going faster than, like, a light jog. It was pretty ridiculous. I'm not going to lie. So, my final point, Raiders, you're cute. Chargers, I think you're going to be good. And Broncos, I don't want to talk about you because you're so disappointing. But the, the Chiefs got it, man. I mean, there's just no argument. And we're going to move on to the NFC. My predictions for these guys are another kind of boilerplate group, but, you know, maybe you'll be surprised by a couple of them. I have the Buccaneers in the NFC South, the Eagles in the East, the Vikings in the North, and the Rams in the West. So, let's go down the list. The Buccaneers in the NFC South. While earlier I was talking about how I didn't trust the Buccaneers' offense as much as I felt like I should and as much as I used to, I still think their defense has been so good this season that I don't even know that it matters. Like, I compared them to the 2015 Broncos, and that's not even a joke. They held Aaron Rodgers to 14 points. The, the Packers have not been particularly um, impressive this year. However, that's still a very big accomplishment when you're holding a top 10 quarterback ever to 14 points. Uh, moving on to the uh, NFC East, I have the Eagles. Now, the Eagles are a very interesting team because they haven't, on the surface, they have not gotten any better. But if you just watch them, they are playing phenomenally. Last year, they had a very good identity that I liked a lot. They knew what they were. They ran the ball really well, and they played tough, physical defense. In the NFL, that wins you a lot of games. But if you want to win the big games, you got to be able to throw it. And there were a couple times last year where it looked like Jalen Hurts was breaking through a little bit, but there were also times where it was just like he doesn't look ready yet. This season, he looks ready. They traded for A.J. Brown, which was a great pickup, I gotta say. He, he never got the credit he deserved on the Titans just because the Titans go, don't get that much attention, but he has looked really good this season. But the bigger piece has been the development of Devontae Smith. He, I mean, his first year... He was coming off of a Heisman season. It was going to be impossible for him to live up to the expectations, and quite frankly, he didn't. I wasn't mad at him for it, but a lot of Eagles fans were like, oh, you've got to trade him, you got to trade him. Do you want to trade him now? Because he looks pretty darn great right now. Um, the development of Jalen Hurts throwing the ball really make, does make this team scary, and even with Dak coming back, I don't think the Cowboys are even close to what they were, and they weren't even all that much to begin with. Losing Amari Cooper, Zeke's another year older, their defense doesn't look as stout as it was last year. I think the Eagles got it. The Vikings in the North is going to be a surprise to a couple people who are surprised that I didn't pick the Packers. Now, I wouldn't 
blame anybody who picks the Packers because it's kind of hard to say that Aaron Rodgers is going to be bad for a whole season. I don't think he's going to be bad for a whole season. I think he's going to get right back to form and we're not going to even miss a beat here. But the thing with the Vikings is just they already won their first game against the Packers, which if you're a Packers fan is very concerning. They also have Justin Jefferson, they have Adam Thielen, they have a bunch of great receivers. Kirk Cousins isn't a great quarterback. I like him personally, but that's really more just for the bit. I don't think he's that great. Um, but I think the Vikings are good enough that they've already won their first game against the Packers. Kirk Cousins does very well historically against Aaron Rodgers, so it would not surprise me if they won both those games. And then I think they can win enough games that they might tie the Packers in wins, but they'll have the tiebreaker, so it won't matter. And moving on to the NFC West, finally, I have the Rams winning it. That's not a surprise to basically anybody. They are the defending champs. Although, in spite of the fact that I've just told you I'm picking them through the division, I'm going to take a second to rip into them a little bit because they have not looked impressive whatsoever. They lost their opening in embarrassing fashion against the Bills, and then they played the Falcons this weekend, had a 28-3 lead against the Falcons, and then they almost falconed the Falcons by letting them come back. They won the game, so I'm not going to completely destroy them for it, but... Matt Stafford, you got to not turn that ball over, sir. It is getting very concerning. That's how he was in Detroit. He would always get the uh, Lions into a big hole, but then he'd be the one to almost get them out of it, and they'd still win. Last year, it didn't matter because the defense was really good, so he didn't have to, even if he turned the ball over, uh, they could get a stop, and then he would take shape as the game continued. However, if the defense isn't as stout as it was, and it's going to be hard for them to be as stout as they were, it's, it's going to be tough. And now might be the point in the show where, on another network, you might hear me try to force some Super Bowl prediction on you. But, at the beginning of the show, I promised you my real takes and my real opinions. So, as much as I'd love to give you a Super Bowl pick, to give you some more content to listen into, here's the thing. I think, personally, that it is ludicrous to try to make a Super Bowl pick this early in the season. Because... Teams change throughout the season. Anybody with any level of sports knowledge know this. Teams grow. They change. Injuries happen. Trades happen. None of these teams that are behind me are going to look the same by the end of the season as they do right now. That's just an objective fact. So there's no point in me telling you who I think is going to be the last team standing if every single team is still in the running for that position. Maybe a couple of weeks from now I'll be able to make a more accurate prediction, but that's not going to be today. That being said, though, I would like to do one more thing and give out my Least Valuable Player of the Week award. Uh, and that player this week is Nelson Aguilar. Now, I'd like to preface this by saying I have nothing personal against Nelson Aguilar. I don't think he's a bad person. I don't even know that he's a bad player. But that fumble against the Ravens, the Patriots had a chance to win. We were going to win the game. We could have driven down the field, scored a touchdown. We were down by five. That's at least six points, maybe eight. We take a three-point lead, and there's going to be barely any time left on the clock. Mac Jones throws his first good pass in what felt like a billion years. He hauls it in. He gets to the sideline. He's almost out of bounds, and he fumbles. And that causes us to lose the game because the Ravens drive right back down the field and score another touchdown. They win by 12. I'm not going to say it was his fault. The Ravens defender made a great play, but come on, man. It's the fourth quarter. Hold on to the dang ball. Now, I want to also say least, least valuable doesn't equal worst. I'm not saying he's going to be horrible for the rest of the season. He might come out on Sunday and have a great game. But this week, he was the least valuable player of the week. Well, that's going to do it for me, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the first show. I'd like to be, uh, extend a thank you to my technical crew and to the, for, to the Kingswood Multimedia Department for making this entire production possible. I'll see you all in two weeks.